Uh, my name is Travis Dawson. I am uh, on the wrong slide. I'm going to be uh, giving you a talk today on network and security analytics with Hadoop. So unless you wandered into the wrong room, this is the talk. Uh, the obligatory agenda slide. So I'm going to start with uh, doing a slight definition of network and security analytics, move on to using Hadoop to help solve some of the problems, in fact, some of the more unique problems with network and security analytics, um, and then talk a little bit about some of the lessons we've learned along the way of, of actually using Hadoop to try to solve some of these very interesting problems. So, now, so helps if I figure out how to use this. Apparently, uh, technology is not my thing. So, uh, I'm a geek. Uh, at least I used to be. I am now, unfortunately, actually. Director of Product Management, so I make PowerPoints all day and herd cats. Uh, uh, basically, pretty pictures are, are my thing now. Uh, but I used to be a principal member of technical staff for Sprint. Uh, I broke stuff. So what this means is that I've spent a good portion of my career looking for new and interesting ways of doing network and security analytics. Um, this includes working with vendors, working with customers, and trying to solve some of the really, really big problems out there for some really large customers. Um, I've come to the conclusion that it's really, really hard. So uh, one of the best definitions I ever got for network and security analytics was given to me by one of my first mentors. And he said, network, security and, network and security analysts are basically you know, practicing a type of voodoo, but they use com computers. The reason why is that you're, you, if you've ever met a network analyst or a security analyst, these people are kind of a little unhinged. Um, they're able to just look at stuff and for some reason say, you know, that's not right, that's wrong. And when you ask them about it, sometimes they can't really tell you why. They just know that this is right or this is wrong. Now the approaches that are, that are currently being taken, you got the more traditional firewalls, IDSs, IPSs that use signatures and blacklists, but you also have some of the more interesting behavioral stuff. The really interesting fields opening up now, Hadoop is responsible for some of it, is the algorithmic, algorithmic um, things, which is really looking deep into the traffic, deep into the, the, the packets, to find what traffic is actually really wrong. Or you can always go back to the old standards, a Ouija board, live chicken, full moon. Basically, anything you want to use, go ahead and have fun. Um, but this, the goal is always the same, to identify malicious problematic traffic before it's able to hurt you. Now, that's actually a, a key point there, is you want to get to things before they actually cause you too much pain. So, what's going against you? Now, the, the people that are against, uh, against you, coming against your network, they have way too much free time, and they are way too smart. Um, these guys are really, really, really smart. Let's just put it that way. The attack vectors have changed recently. Not recently, more over the last four or five years. They've actually morphed into the polymorphic randomized payloads. This makes them increasingly harder to detect with signatures, and even some behaviorals, uh, behavioral methods are now becoming less and less effective. APTs are real, APTs are advanced persistent threats. These are people that really want to get into your network and have a lot of patience, or they have a lot of money and are able to just sit there and wait long enough. Um, the graph on the, the side actually shows you the number of, of uh, vulnerabilities found in each quarter. It averages about 1,000 new vulnerabilities every quarter. These vulnerabilities are against everything from the uh, operating systems themselves to the applications, and the protocols. Basically, there's simply too many new vulnerabilities every year to keep track of and to try to keep up with. It's the world's biggest game of whack-a-mole. You're just not gonna win it. So with all this, the traditional methods, IDSs, IPSs, and firewalls are becoming less and less effective. In fact, quite ineffective, really. So, and to add insult to injury, you have the fact that uh, 10 gig links are now becoming a standard for a lot of, especially the customers that I deal with, that it's becoming the standard to have 10 gig plus links. Uh, this is about 15 million packets per second and just a mountain of data. Keeping up is just really hard. So how do you find a needle in a stack of needles? This is the traditional network security problem. It's 
you start by trying to figure out where to look. And then you try to ask, what am I looking for? In many cases, you don't know what you are looking for, but you know what you're not looking for. And that actually helps quite a bit. But the more interesting areas of research now, and the more interesting areas uh, <clears throat> of detection, are actually looking not for what am I looking for, what am I not looking for, but they're looking for what's not right. Is this correct? Is this what I expect on my network? Is this what should be on my network? What is normal? And <clears throat> trying to solve this, you need a lot of data. Um, normal is a relative term. Correct is a relative term. It all depends on how much, how far you go back. Now, when I say more data, I'm looking at not days or hours of data or network traffic uh, information. I'm looking more like weeks and months, and in some cases, years of data to find things. This is a lot, a lot of data. Um, the algorithms also to find not right are really not easy. Um, there's a lot of research on this, but there's also a lot of new algorithms out there that are really helping with this, but it's not easy. And for doing this, you need to have one algorithm feed another, feed another, feed another, feed another. It's an iterative process. And because the false positive rate is high, you actually have to slowly weed down that too. So there's a lot of things working against you. Whoops. Yeah, as I said, technology, not my thing. So. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm just going to do a, a quick rant here on um, SQL, mainly because I tried for many years to make RDBSs work in this, to work for me for network security analytics. Um, let me save you the trouble that don't work. Um, you know, it's, RDBMSs have been around for a lot of years. Um, they're great for solving known problems. Trying to get them to solve for the unknown problems is actually very, very hard and in many cases impossible. Um, however, they do have a very good use in many areas and as part of a system they actually work quite well. So now moving to Hadoop for security uh, analytics, uh, the reason why we moved to that, uh, <clears throat> to this platform was the sheer amount of data. Um, even just keeping the basic metadata for sessions about 100 billion sessions minimum for a few days to a few weeks, hundreds of terabytes of data, and ingesting dozens of data types and millions of sessions per hour. This is a huge amount of data coming in just to do basic security analytics. The algorithms, well, that actually is a direct quote from one of my customers. Um, we're looking for sessions that look something like this, or maybe unlike this other thing. You can do that, right? Yeah, as a product manager, you basically blink a couple times and your eyes go crossed and you nod your head and cry. Um, and we don't know what's coming into our network. We never know what we're going to get into the system and we never know what we're really looking for. As a result, it's highly unstructured data. Um, finally, the price per analytic hour. Um, with, with Hadoop, we found a, a very good price per analytic hour and that's actually one of the measurements that we use is how much does it cost to run a certain analytic in a certain amount of time? So um, one of the workflows that we've, we've used a lot and uh, kind of the, the, um, the benchmark by which we judged a lot of systems was uh, this relatively simple workflow. It, it seems complicated, but it's actually one of the more simple ones that we have. It's finding a polymorphic bot or worm infection vector. Now, we don't really care much about just finding the infected hosts. Um, finding the infected host is, is kind of like, you know, pointing and laughing. You, you don't really get any value out of that. It's, if, if you're already infected, it's, it's really not very helpful. You want to find how that, that bot, how that worm got into the network so you can block th th that method for, you know, future infections so you don't get more bots on your network. So walking through this, we took the same approach that uh, a network analyst would take um, looking at the same data. Granted, we're doing it on hundreds of billions of records over several days. First is to find suspected hosts. The, the methods we used, um, at least, <clears throat> excuse me, were, we, of course, we use signatures for the easy stuff whenever that, that was there. But more often, we're finding that behavioral clustering and machine learning algorithms are actually able to find 
a lot of botnet or bot-like activity. Entropy analysis is a really good way of finding out when someone's doing too much scanning or using too many ports or doing something that is just a little too random, a little too chaotic. Moving on from there, once we have this set of, um, of suspected hosts, we can then go backwards and look at who they're talking to on a regular basis. Now, when I say regular basis, this is something that, that's actually really um, ingenious that a few of the guys came up with. They look for regularity and irregularity in conversations that, someone's ha that, that each host has, and they find the irregular ones, basically the keep-alives, things like um, when you're on your VPN connection, that single keep-alive packet that's always there to keep the VPN alive. Well, bots do the same thing with their command and control to keep telling the command and control, by the way, I'm still here, I can still take orders. So that's an easy way or an, in an interesting way of finding the command and control. Then you, you reverse that from all the command and control, we then flip it around and say, okay, who else is talking to these command and control servers in a way similar to the, the initial set that we already found? Well, what you do is you, what that, that gives you is gives you another set of possible infected, infect, uh, possible infected hosts. Now you have this huge set of, of possible infected hosts and a set of command and control. So taking all of that, <clears throat> You then use clustering, uh, especially on this layer seven information, take the clustering information, and you're usually able to narrow it down to five or 10 very specific layer seven protocol and uh, layer seven uh, metadata information that is common for a good portion of all those possible infected bots. What this gives you is that layer seven information, which more often than not is now HTTP, is your infection vector, and that's a simple way of just one block, and now you, you just stop that entire worm dead in its tracks. You're not going after the command and control, which uh, the, the <laughs> miscreants have now figured out that they just move the command and control every few hours. So you don't go after that target, you go after how they get to the, the, the bots in the beginning. This has proven to be actually very effective, um, and uh, a lot of our customers are now using this, this simple workflow to remove a lot of infected hosts and keep infected hosts off the network. So, so what makes all this work? Um, your standard, the standard Hadoop tools that we use were entropy, FFTs, fast forward transforms, sorry, and behavioral jobs to find some of the infected hosts. We also use a lot of machine learning and clustering to find similar hosts. Anyone that behaves like one of those, guys, one of those suspects gets grouped in with the suspects. Um, <clears throat> this is mostly useful in finding the polymorphic, uh, polymorphic worms and polymorphic uh, viruses that are, out, that are out there and becoming more and more popular. We can't rely on the payload being the same each time, but there's enough behavioral similarities that we are able to use that as a key to actually find more and more the, the inf infected hosts. Um, we also use some very custom co-clustering, uh, custom clustering, uh, specifically something called hourglass co-clustering. Um, this gives uh, behavioral over layer four and layer seven information that's actually kind of unique. Um, in addition, we, uh, for the system to work, we also have a streaming engine, statistics, and we use uh, RDBMS for some visualization. So this is the beast. This is um, many tools enabling each other. Uh, what we did was we, we discovered early on that we were gonna need a lot of things working together. So this is the, one of the solutions that we came up with. We capture the traffic, take all the session metadata, a lot of it, this is anywhere from four to 10 billion records per day per one gig link. Um, so it's a lot of metadata um, for stuff that we do know, signatures, stuff like that. We have a streaming analytic engine that works, uh, that works at high speed, 10 gig plus each. Um, but the most interesting one is the deep analytics. That's the Hadoop cluster, specifically MapR. Um, we actually dump all of these records from all of our individual capture centers into this one massive cluster to do all this work. The, <clears throat> the results, the only result, the only thing that gets <laughs> put out of this is the, the results, which is actually a BI cube, um, actually just a simple hypercube that's dumped into an RDBMS so that we can visualize it. 
Um, the, the little guy on the right, his name is Franklin. We call him Franklin the ang Angry Robot. So he does look like a robot the more I look at it. Um, so what did we learn during this? Um, we're, we learned not to use a hammer when we wanted a scalpel. Uh, specifically, Hadoop is really good at a lot of things, but it, it's not meant to do everything. Um, certain low latency jobs for visualization, Hadoop's just not good for. Dumping the results into an uh, RDBMS for easier presentation, it made, it made a lot more sense. But Hadoop actually really opened up a lot of doors for us. Now, one of the things that was most interesting was we have never been able to before look at days, weeks, months of data, because it simply was too many, too, too much data to, to do. And also, a lot of the, the analytics that we did on the smaller scale, we simply weren't able to scale up until we started using Hadoop. Um, simply put, Hadoop and Hadoop was able to open up a lot of doors for us. New algorithms were made possible by Hadoop. Um, specifically, a lot of the clustering and machine learning um, with the, the way that the, the worms and the attacks are coming today, nothing is really stable. Nothing, it looks like, nothing today will look the same tomorrow for the same attack. As a result, you have to be a little bit more ingenious on trying to find the same attack from day one to day two. And in the way that we've come at it is actually using clustering and machine learning. And it, it's proven very invaluable. Now, We've also learned that we have to use a streaming engine, an RDBMS, in a conjunction with Hadoop in order to not only feed Hadoop, but also to make, Hadoop, to make the results actually visible, uh, make it viewable in a reasonable amount of time. But the number of tools that we use now, we're not constrained by any single one. As a result, we use the best tool possible for each part of the job. So, with that, I'm about 10 minutes early, so I will take any questions you have. Uh, if you can, please uh, go to one of the mics. Hi, I actually have two questions. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, sensitive ears. Yeah. First question. Can you tell exactly what tools are you using for data ingest, so all of these packets that travel through the uh, real-time analytics engine, I mean, what exact tools do you use to actually uh, put all of the data into HDFS? Uh, it's actually ours. NARS actually makes a capture, a capture layer product and a streaming engine. So we were, we're a little bit ahead of that. But um, there are actually several out there that we also support. We also support NetFlow and a few others. But the, the streaming engine and everything um, was actually made way back when for billing mediation. Don't laugh, it works. Uh, and, um, but, but it's ours. It's custom code C. Okay, thanks. And uh, my second question is, uh, this is very useful for uh, detecting sort of abnormalities uh, associated with attacks, but have you tried uh, detecting abnormalities associated with uh, suboptimal network performance? So, so that you can basically guide the customers on, you know, to correct path of actually optimizing the network performance for them. Uh, I'm sorry, you're going to repeat that, I apologize. Uh, so have you tried using the very same approach for uh, network performance uh, predictions or, you know, guidance so that you can basically... Capacity planning has also been used and used somewhat successfully. Also performance monitoring. Uh, what's fun is that uh, when servers start behaving a little abnor abnormal, i.e. The, the, the latency between packets goes up, um, that's a really good sign something's gone wrong. Or the error codes that are coming out, it, you should constantly always have 200s, right? If you start getting 500s or things like that, um, it's you, it, we're able to actually go back in time and figure it out and, and do work like that. So for both capacity planning and performance monitoring, the same system is being used with almost no modification. Except for, um, for performance monitoring, we add a, a couple uh, extra fields for the interpacket gaps, which again, was something that we didn't think was going to be important until we actually had the ability to do that at large scale. Now we're finding that the interpacket gaps um, not only is a good indication of bots, but also for is very useful in uh, performance monitoring. 
Hi, uh, I was wondering if you have done anything to make a catalog of all the normal behaviors or software programs that might be out there so that you can kind of remove those, or are there just too many legitimate um, uh, there programs? Was, there's right now two projects running on. Um, one is to uh, catalog all the applications, and um, I, I'm going to shoot that one in the head as soon as possible because it, it's just too many of them. Um, the second one is um, more interesting, and that was uh, specifically toward Android and wireless, um, cataloging all of them. Um, and while it sounds like a daunting task, it actually works. Um, works quite well. Uh, right now, the, uh, the catalog has about, 20, about 15 to 20,000, um, with an accuracy of about 95 plus percent. Is, is any of that public? Can I go read about that somewhere? Um, that's actually right now in the research phase. Okay. Thank so, you. Uh, if you want to, um, come up and I'll, I'll give me your card and I'll make sure you get more information on it. But it's in research. It's actually kind of cool. Yeah, it sounds great. Thanks. I thought it was going to fail miserably, but again, what do I know? Technology, not my thing. So a uh, multi-part question. Can you talk a little bit more about the streaming engine you're using, whether it's general, general purpose or specific to network packets? And then also the integration between your batch and real-time data flows? OK. Um, uh, the first part is the streaming engine is a general purpose. It's actually uh, custom configurable. So it, it, the way you configure it is uh, you can either go into the code itself, or more likely it, it, there's a, an application that we use custom that looks like Visio from hell. You basically, you know, it's made really for packets, but um, anything that we call a NARS vector, as long as we can vectorize it, it's metadata, um, you, we can act on it in the streaming engine. So it's a general purpose one, it's uh, written in C. And um, the way we go from batch to the RDBMS is um, the, the batch, specifically MapR and Hadoop, um, <clears throat> they dump files into HDFS, and then we have a little process that sits there and looks for these files and immediately loads them, uh, bulk loads them into um, uh, an RDBMS. The RDBMS is not for writes, uh, sorry, it's not doing um, inserts, it just does bulk loads and reads, that's it. It's not allowed to do anything else. We've removed everything else from it. We stripped it right down. It's a lot faster. Although um, looking around, actually talking to a few people today, Elephant, DB, and a few other options are actually kind of interesting for that. Yes, I was curious if you could speak maybe a little bit to how you were using machine learning and uh, what maybe were some particular things that you found in using that. Uh, the machine learning is helping us determine what is normal. In other words, you take uh, about uh, two weeks' worth of data for a specific host, mostly targeted towards servers, not for uh, like client hosts, like PCs. Um, and you try to use machine learning to figure out what should be in the next day, and then you apply the next day. You learn again, apply the next day. And whenever the delta is a little bit off or whenever it's not correct, um, the prediction is not correct within the machine learning, you send an alert or you, you say, I'm sorry, that that's now a suspicious host because you did something that I didn't learn before and I didn't expect you to do. So, so uh, you talked about machine learning. What kind of algorithms did you use or uh, well, the clustering, uh, KNN, or something uh, like different botnets have different features, so those are going to have a different uh, uh, way of algorithm quite for a, each of yeah, them. Quite a few different ones, and a couple. Most of them are custom. Um, we use a couple of the the K the K clustering. Uh, I'm going to get that name wrong. It's out of Mahout, um, but most of it we found insufficient, um, and. Um, we have now moved uh, to where we're actually writing our own clustering algorithms um, that are unfortunately a little bit above my intelligence level. So I could put you in touch with somebody who will tell you a little bit more about them, but I can tell you that uh, three of them are patented. Um, the others are open. The clustering needs uh, some kind of labeling of the data or training data, and gathering training data for botnet itself is a big challenge. Across, uh, yeah. Um, the, Believe it or not, and, and I hope that nobody here writes botnets, but the, 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 the most interesting thing we found is that uh, as the, they all behave about the same, or at least are able to be clustered at la using just layer four statistics and not even layer seven. So simple layer four information and just looking for people that, looking for behaviors, not only in um, number of sessions, but how the sessions go back and forth, and um, all the handshakes, 
um, is actually just clustering based on very simple things has actually proven to be very effective for us. So it, it's, if you try to dig too deep, you'll outsmart yourself. And um, we didn't dig too deep, and we found that we had an over 70% hit rate. So one last question. Uh, Flame malware, which has been around, and uh, did you have any experience to share about Not that, that I'm willing to go into. <laughs> Sorry. Um, a lot of my customers are three-letter agencies, and I'm pretty sure that they're allowed to just shoot me. Okay. In fact, I think I signed that agreement last week again. So. Hi. Uh, um, I wonder if you could highlight by name uh, some of the interesting algorithms that you said were not possible before. Um, you know, just general approaches. Um, uh, and then especially anything, anything fuzzy, really, okay. any, anything that was learned, even some of the learning stuff with RDBMSs, without we we just were unable to do. Um, even some of the entropy equations over a long period of time, um, which entropy is uh, was is very useful for fighting worms and bots. Um, it's not perfect, but it's actually very good. Um, we were just unable to do even the simple math. The fast Fourier transforms um, were difficult, not impossible. You could do them. Um, we tried doing uh, user-defined functions in um, a lot of the RDBMSs, and just uh, if anyone's ever used uh, an RDBMS and tried to do user-defined functions, um, you just start writing checks. Um, it just becomes extraordinarily expensive in hardware. Uh, they're, they're good at it to a degree, but when you start trying to use them too much, um, no matter which RDBMS we used, it was just, we were just killing them. Are you, are you running uh, many algorithms in, in your streaming process layer? Um, the streaming process right now, we're limiting it to simple statistics and uh, certain other very simple uh, things that we can all do in memory. The reason why is the streaming uh, engine is entirely memory. Uh, those things don't even need disks. They need uh, basically a disk to boot up. <clears throat> they don't, everything else is in memory because it has to be, um, uh, be able to uh, maintain speed. Are, are you doing online estimate type algorithms at that level? Uh, to a degree, but not really. Um, it's, it's one of the things we looked at, but. Um, right now, we kind of failed in our first attempt. We're going to make another attempt. Okay. Um, they tell me we're going to make another attempt. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. Thanks. Are you integrating, integrating with any SEM tools or incident response tools for? Any ESM tools? SEM tools. SEM. Um, right now, we do have, uh, we do export to a few different formats, including uh, ArcSight Ceph. Syslog, um, SNMP, a few others. Um, once the data is in the, once the summary data is in the RDBMS, it's quite literally a matter of writing a, a bit of code to make the uh, make the, make it be emitted to really anything we want. So it's if you ask for it, eh, it's a relatively easy experience for us. So you briefly talked about um, learning from one node, but if if one host is bad. You look at other hosts that are connected to this host, and then you say that, hey, they may be bad mm -hmm. as well. Is that the extent of your network or graph analysis, no. or do you? No, <laughs> not by a long shot. Okay. Um, yes, graph analysis is actually used uh, a bit, um, specifically going from um, when you, you go from the initial infected host to command and control, and then back to infection vector, you have to keep, in, keep track of the time of each, what, what each, when each happened. Um, but also the friend of a friend um, sure. type scenario is actually becoming more and more useful. The reason why is that the infection mechanism comes in from one path, but it goes and downloads the actual payload, the actual virus or actual worm from a th second host or sometimes even a third host. So we, we actually have to watch all for all of that and doing the friend of a friend analysis actually has proven to be somewhat useful, though not perfectly useful just yet. Um, there's certain other use cases that I didn't go into where a friend of a friend um, does help a lot, does um, perform, does actually perform a lot better than other algorithms. But it's very, very expensive. Okay. So do it's you very expensive for us. Yeah. No, so, yeah. so do you also look at um, <coughs> subgraph extraction and looking at graph similarities or subgraph similarities or communities within the graph <laughs> for, for your, you know, yeah. coming out with a community of nodes or hosts which are bad and then applying the same kind of a pattern and figuring out other such you know, communities. And that's where we're heading, but 
right now getting the math right is a lot harder than we initially thought. Um, so we're still working on it, but that's an active project in our CTO group. Um, to, to try to find better ways of doing it. I believe it's called Bot Scout um, in the CTO group. Woo! Yay! So I am not going to stand in your way to the next talk. So y'all have a good day.